morning and welcome to worship this morning. Looking out the congregation, it looks like many stayed up late watching the Georgia game. Woo, 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 woo. Some of y'all are happy. It is good to see all of you here to worship today. It's such a blessing to gather for worship with Christian friends as we worship our Savior together. If you're our guest, we're especially glad to have you here with us this morning. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to come and uh, worship with us. If you're here, we have a registration pad. You can take a, take a moment and pick it up and fill it out and pass it to your neighbor. Kind of give us a chance to connect with you and to tell you a little bit about our church and answer any questions that you may have. We have gathered here this morning, many of us for different reasons, but all for the world, to worship one God. And as we enter to that time of worship, let us take a moment to prepare our hearts and our minds as our musicians lead us into that time of worship.
as we affirm our faith together for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ.
everything wonderful, everything pure in life is a gift from our loving, gracious God. So when we gather in this place this morning, mindful of just how good you are to us, and Lord, we bring our praise, we bring our thanksgiving, we bring our joy, because we are so thankful for all that you have done for us. Now we're also mindful of the many prayer concerns that we have in our, in our hearts and our minds today. For many in our church family who we love here are facing some challenging times. Or Pastor Ken's facing some challenging times. Jimmy Betty's daughter is facing some difficult times. Or so many prayer concerns that we have today. Lord, we lift them up to you. Now, we don't know everything that's going on in their lives, but you do. Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for your grace. We pray for your love. We be present in their lives. Lord, as we are in this season that we call stewardship season, a season where we think about the gifts that we have, the certain spiritual gifts, the financial gifts, the prayers, the, the gift of each other. There's so many gifts. When we ask that you would speak into our hearts how best for us to use those gifts. So Lord, we pray that you guide us as a church, guide us individually, speak to our hearts as we look toward the future, as we follow you and your call for us. When we ask all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who came, who lived, who died, and who is risen. And each and every day we seek to follow the Christ. As we do that, we faithfully pray the prayer that He taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Alright, it's time to invite our children to come up. Our children's time again.
As we give our offerings and tithes this morning, let us remember the fact that these tithes and offerings are always yours. They belong to you. May we never withhold what is yours. Please accept these offerings and tithes with gladness, Lord, and may these offerings extend the work of your kingdom in your church, your community, and into the world which you have made. In Jesus' name, amen. Manager said to himself, 
What will I do now that my master is firing me as his manager? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm too proud to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I am removed from my manager's position, people will welcome me into their houses. One by one, the manager sent for each person who owed his master money. He said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, 500 gallons of olive oil. The master said to him, Take your contract, sit down quickly, and write 450 gallons. Then the manager said to another, How much do you owe? He said, 1,000 bushels of wheat. He said, Take your contract and write 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted cleverly. People who belong to this world are more clever in dealing with their peers than are people who belong to the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to make friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful with little is also faithful with much. And the one who is dishonest with little is also dishonest with if you haven't been faithful with worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? If you haven't been faithful with someone else's property, who will give you your own? No household servant can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be loyal to the one and have contempt for the other. You cannot serve God with wealth. This is the word of God. For us and the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated.
beautiful words. Thank you, choir, for sharing those with us today. Made a deal with my oldest son several months ago that if I told the story about him and not give, give permission for him to tell the story, I'd have to give him some money. And this morning, I didn't know he was going to be acting like it. I thought I'd get away with it. But you know, there have been times as a parent when I punished my children and they did not deserve to be punished. You ever been there before, parents? You punish them and then realize they probably didn't deserve that. One of those times was on the baseball field several years ago. Kate was about five years old and he was on the t-ball team and I was the coach for his t-ball team. And we had one boy on our team probably would have been better playing football than T-ball. This kid, whenever the ball was hit, no matter what position he was playing, if he was playing left field, and the ball was hit the right field, he ran all the way over the right field to get the ball, knocking over every other kid in the way process. And uh, one day, you know, my son is one that's kind of a meat kid, you know, not, not real, um, Angry or didn't have to take it too much. Now, this I'm talking about the big one. The little one, he's a different story. And he got bumped a few times by this kid, and he finally got to where he was tired. He was frustrated with it. He got hit one too many times, and he ran over and got the ball from him and knocked Kate on the ground. And Kate jumped up, knocked the kid's hat off of his head, and started yelling in his face. Now, me, I'm thinking, that's the past. They're judging me. There, there goes those pastors' kids again. You know all about those pastors' kids. So I got Kate. I said, Kate, go to the dugout. You're in trouble. Go sit down. And I sat him down over there. And the more I thought about that, the more, instead of being upset with him, I was proud of him. I was proud of him for standing up for himself at that moment. You know, I punished him when I probably should not have. And I was proud of him. What he, what he did. And you know, that, that brings me to the point that sometimes parents get it wrong. Sometimes we get it wrong. But let me be honest. As I read this scripture this morning, it seems that Jesus gets it wrong. In that sense, as you read this morning, you know, while I punish my son and he should have been praised, Jesus seems to praise someone when they shouldn't be punished. A rich man finds out this household manager is wasting his estate. He's lazy and not doing what he should be doing. So he tells them basically that you're probably going to get fired because you're not doing what I've hired you and asked you to do. Now devastated, the manager goes to the people who owe him money and reduce the price to try to get some of the money back. So he's basically, once again, trying to fix the problem by losing even more money for the rich home. Yet, reading the scripture, it appears that Jesus is honoring the man for doing these very dishonest things. The scripture says, says this, the, the master commended the dishonest man because he had the truth. The scripture also says, listen to this, make friends for yourself by means of this honest wealth. <clears throat> so that when it's gone, they may welcome you into their eternal homes. Now that's not, that's hardly not a Christian worldview, is it? Have you ever heard a sermon that said this? Be dishonest, act shrewdly. And make friends for yourself by dishonest wealth. You ever heard of a three-point sermon that said that? Probably not. What is with this passage? You know, in my research of this passage throughout this week, I've read several commentaries about it, and many of the commentaries are doing all that they can to do sort of exegetical gymnastics around the scripture. They say, you know, what, what Jesus really means is this. He doesn't really mean that. What Jesus really means is this or this, or this. 
this and many different interpretations of the scripture. But you know, as I wrestled with it this week, I think that the scripture means what it means. I think that the scripture says just what it says. And I believe that as Jesus is using this story, he's not using it as an example for how we should live. He's using it to point to some important things about our lives and about our faith. Jesus tells this story not to admire the manager's laziness or shrewdness or his ethics. I think the story instead is to remind those gathered around him and listen to the story. You had the Pharisees there, you had the disciples, and you had you and me, us. To remind us that we as God's people are called to treasure things in our life that are not temporary, but the things that are eternal. You know, the manager gave up money in the story to secure his future. He didn't do it the right way, but that's what he did. He sacrificed today to have hope for his future for tomorrow. And using his story and his example, I think Jesus is trying to share up, show us what life looks like looking toward the future. Jesus says this, if you haven't been faithful with worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? You know, this is a tough scripture, but I think its message for us this morning is pretty simple. I think it's this. Live for the true riches. Live for the true riches. Live for the things that matter for eternity. I think that's God's message for you and for me this morning. You know, one of those true riches for us, I think, is relationships. Relationships. You know, when the manager reduced the price of the debt, money takes the back seat in the story. So what's truly important? He sacrificed a little money to invest in his future, and instead he created relationships, and he created friendships for himself and for the rich man. This story is about creating those relationships. And you know, as we're talking about our greatest gifts of these next few weeks, perhaps there's no greatest gift for us and for you than the people that God puts in your path. Every single day. People are important. Relationships are a gift that God has given all of us. You know, I was just visiting with someone just yesterday in our church who's facing a tough time in their life, and this is what I've heard her say several times. And I've heard this not just from her, but from many people over my time in ministry. I could never make it without my church family. My church family means so much. You ever said that before? Can you believe that? Can you make it through difficult times in life without people, without your family, without your friends, without your church family? You know, if you haven't got to that place before, one day you probably will. You'll realize that all the money in the world is pointless when you're facing heartbreak, when you're facing pain. And it said those dark moments in life when you treasure the true riches in your life. People. People. You know, if you're going to invest in something, invest in people. Invest in relationships. Don't see people as an end to a mean for yourself. But see them as a gift from God. A beautiful gift that God has given us. Now, of course, sometimes people can be difficult. Again, people can break your heart. And investing in people can sometimes hurt when things don't go so well. But you know, I think there's no greater risk worth taking than believing in people. Believing in the people sitting around you. Trusting them. So I think it's important that we're patient with each other. Let's give each other the benefit of that. Let's forgive each other. 
And when people don't live up to your expectations, and that's going to happen, you know, they might have no idea what's going on in their life, in the background that they're facing. It might be that in that moment, they need your friendship and your love more than ever. Live for the true riches in life. And one of those true riches is relationships. And I think another one of those true riches that our scripture talks about is eternity. Living for eternity. And I believe one reason that the rich man was pleased with the manager of our scripture was because his kindness toward the debtors likely paid off for his reputation. At that point, his reputation was probably pretty bad. There's a chance that he would get more business because of what this manager did, because of the grace that the manager offered to these debtors that we find in the story. So his decision paid off for the future. You know, I think as Christians, we should know all too well the importance of making sacrifices today for the sake of eternity. You know, we as Christians are what we call an eschatological people. That means we're people that live for the next, that live for eternity. We believe that life today is about eternity. And I believe that we give today for the sake of eternity. You know, we don't give to be blessed. We don't give expecting God to give us something back. We give because we want to invest in eternity. Invest for the sake of God's kingdom. We give to what we believe to be true riches. You know, one Sunday morning, the pastor of a small town church went outside to find a group of children who were unable to get into the church for Sunday school because the church was too small. The church was so packed in the small church that there were children outside who could not be in. Because it was so, it was so packed. One of those children was a six-year-old girl named Patty. Now, when the pastor stepped outside and saw little Patty, he lifted her up in his arms and put her, put her on, on his shoulders and carried her into the church and found a place for her to be able to be there for Sunday school. You know, the next morning, as he walked to church, the pastor saw Patty again and stopped to talk to her. And he told her that he hoped that someday the church could get a little bit bigger and that they could build some new buildings so that everybody in the community that wanted to come to church would be able to. And the church would be large enough so that everybody that wanted to come could. That's what shared that with that six-year-old girl. Now, two years later, unfortunately, little Patty died. And the pastor was asked to preach now after the service, Patty's mother found the pastor and shared a few words with him and then handed the pastor a small purse that she had. He opened the purse and inside the purse was 57 cents. Now she told him that Patty, for two years, had been saving her pennies so that she could give to help the church build a building big enough so that all the children in the community could come to Sunday school. So the pastor took those 57 pennies, took them back to his congregation, and told the people about the little girl who had been saving her pennies to help build the Sunday school building. And I'm sure you know the rest of the story. The people were so inspired by Hattie's 57 cents gift. But they gave faithfully until they built a new, wonderful facility where all the children in the community could come together for Sunday school. If you haven't been faithful with worldly wealth, the scripture says, who will trust you with true riches? What we've learned from this manager, what we've learned from Hattie, is that how we handle today can have a huge effect on tomorrow. Our resources that are entrusted to us today are given to us for the sake of tomorrow. 
for the sake of the future, for the sake of eternity. And this is a passage I think that's about vision. I think Jesus was talking to the disciples, and I think he's talking to us in this scripture about using the resources that we have for what we think is important. You know, I think this commitment season, this stewardship season, you know, as we look to Commitment Sunday next week, I think it's a time for us to just rethink about those commitments. To remember that as a church, as members of the church, we promise to support the church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. You know, as we have this little card, probably sitting by our, sitting on a table at home somewhere, I hope that you take it, and I hope when you see the word commitment on it, I hope you don't just think of finances. And that's sort of the part of it. I know that everybody in our church brings their commitment card next Sunday. Fill that. And if you don't have yours, we have several in the back as you need. As you pray, and as you see this word commitment, I know that you see that also as being committed to God in all those areas. With your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Because God wants us to be about what matters. God wants our lives to be focused on true riches. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As we close our service this morning, as we build up toward our commitments, I invite you to come and gather around this altar for prayer. I invite you to respond as you feel led to this day. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn.